Well, we've been in the middle of a series the last few weeks, uh, a new one for me this uh, fall, which is, oh, oh, here comes the pen delivery. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm gonna sell it on eBay. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, when everything goes wrong, the adventure begins. Now I started out with this and I was kind of excited about it and because uh, I thought, you know, this is the kind of thing that'll really help you all and uh, speak to your issues, you know. And, and then it was like I slammed into a wall this week and went, dang, this one's for me. Um, so, uh, so here we go. Um, Jesus is talking and, he, and, he, and says, uh, Luke 15, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, um, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Hey, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word and teach us how we might uh, allow you to come find us in our, all of our lostness. And uh, we trust you and uh, that's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Well, you know, this is a, a common parable, right? Everybody's heard that before. That's not new to you. Um, the 99 sheep. There were actually some famous paintings done of Jesus by the artist who did the uh, Breck hair shampoo commercials, you know, the flowing locks. And so that person did some pictures of Jesus, you know, carrying the sheep gently on his shoulders and all those things, looking like a Breck girl basically, you know, uh, I don't know how that happened, but, uh, and the thing you need to know, you know, the, the sheep wandering off, just to give you the, you know, they're, they're not all that willful, and they're not rebellious, and they're not attitude like me, you know, or something like that, they just kind of nibble their way, and just keep nibbling, and then pretty soon, where the heck am I? That's it. It's not willful, it's not circumstances, they just kind of nibble their way along and then they don't even realize they're lost. But the shepherd does, according to this parable, the shepherd recognizes it and goes after them and kind of follows the nibble marks probably. I, I don't know how they do it, but, but, um, but leaves all the others unprotected because they don't need anything. They're all good. You know, most of my life, especially as a pastor, I've always thought that I was the 99, you know, me and my gang, and we were the 99 because we don't have any needs and we're okay and we can take care of things and we don't need the Lord to go, so Lord, why don't you go find, you know, the problem people, right? The people who have issues, the people who are struggling. Go find them and we'll be fine right here, you know? We can take care of it. If you need anything, Lord, just, you know, give a call. We'll, we'll be there for you. How did I get that so wrong? See, I think that lostness is something that affects us all. And I think that's why Jesus is talking about that. We're, we all become the one from time to time. And our problem, and it's my problem, is that I usually don't recognize my own lostness. Because others are so much more obvious to me, you know. I know you guys are lost, but you know. And, um, and our lostness can take shape in a lot of ways. If we would stop and allow God to find us, we could realize and recognize exactly what areas of our life we are lost. You know, some, sometimes we're lost in our money, we're in our finances, they, too much of it or too little of it or whatever it is, you know, and, and, we, and, and we just get lost and we don't know our way out and how are we going to solve this? Sometimes it's a health issue, 
some or health issues or a whole series of them, and it just seems like we've gotten out into it. And I'll tell you, if anybody's ever gone into uh, you know medical stuff, you know it's easy to get lost. Uh, um, I've wandered in Stevens Hospital more times, taking the wrong elevators. You know, uh, you get off if if you're really courteous and everything, and you get off on the right floor from the wrong elevator, it doesn't help you. Um, and then um, we get lost in our emotions. Things they just kind of well up and stir up and and agitate or whatever or fear or those things, and and we don't even realize that we've wandered off in that world. Um, you know, in our in our family, uh, the whole world of mental illness, you can wander in for a long, long time and not realize how lost you are in it. And and most of the professionals don't know the way out. You know, they're monkeys with darts. So, you know, uh, but there's a lostness in that and a sense of uh, we need to be found. We need to be found. And uh, it's, it's deeply rooted in our um, culture. And I've, I've probably drawn this for you before, so bear with me. And Eileen told me that my body gets in the way of this, so you people don't ever see this. So, so sorry about that. Next time I'll remove my body. <laughs> it's the thing that as we're growing up and young kids, we get the message from our parents, you know, I love you, just be perfect, or be good, or be smart, or be strong, or be faithful or whatever it is we get that message and we hear I will love you only if you will be strong perfect and so we decide great they'll love me only if I'm perfect so I'll be perfect and then inevitably we fall off the wagon and we're not perfect and therefore we no longer have earned their love and what and so we're down here going well they can't love me anymore because of what I've done and so what do we do when we get to this situation this was uh, taught to us from a transactional analysis, so you know you can blame them. What we do is we go and hide because we're hurt, and we don't feel loved, and we don't feel valued, and we don't feel like like we we earn their love, and so we go and hide. And when you're hiding, I've done my share of this and different things. When you're hiding, what is it that you want to have happen more than anything else? Come find me. That's the message when we're hiding. And you think, well, why are you hiding? If you want, you just come on out. You know, well, you, you know, we don't. So we just hide and just hope that somebody will come and find us. And they don't. Okay, so forget it. They don't. And so eventually we discover that. We realize it. We're wasting our time. And so we come back out again. And then we start climbing the stairs. Okay, next time I'll be perfect and they will love me. And then we spend our life going through this cycle, wanting to be loved, wanting to be found, and continually falling down, getting back up, and falling down, and getting back up. And it seems like there's no way out of that. Now, the issue is, first of all, we need to be loved regardless of if we're perfect. Okay, Can, is that right? We need to be loved. We need to know that we're loved, and we're lovable. My, my prayer for Damien was that he would live long enough to realize he was lovable. That, that was it. And because uh, you don't want to cut that short. And, but once we realize we're lovable and we're hiding away, feeling like we've done something wrong, we've caused these problems, we need someone to come after us. And that is the profound message of this scripture in Luke 15. The shepherd leaves the trouble-free ones and goes after the one who's lost. And, uh, and brings them back. And brings them home. And, is sell and not, not gruffly, you know, like some of us experienced growing up, where, you know, well, you'll get it when you get home. You know, we're glad we found you, but, you know, when you get home, I don't want to be found. I don't want to be found. <laughs> you know, it's too painful. But, but, um, but celebrating all the way home. How about that? Celebrating all the way home and then celebrating with everybody else once you get home. The lost one becomes the, the basis for all the joy. Now, 
I spent a lot of time in my life, you know, teaching people that they need to seek God, you know, go after God, you need to find God in your life. And people come to me and they go, how can I find God? And, I, and I'll tell them, you know, here's some things you can do. Uh, I'm really good at that for others, you know. And, uh, and I spent a lifetime telling people how to seek God. And uh, last night I was in a funk. I was in a major league funk of anger, frustration, and depression. And so I thought, what can I do? What can I do? I can't preach tomorrow. Can't. So you know what I did? I did something Damien taught me. I got my computer out and listened to T.D. Jakes. <laughs> An hour and forty minute sermon. It was, like, and, and but it was really, you know, and uh, you know, what a great, great preacher. But the thing was, he was saying, it is not amazing if we have needs and we go out and get our needs met. That is not an amazing thing. And he said, you know, if you're driving along in your car and you're running out of gas and you go looking for a gas station, that is not amazing. Even if you find a gas station before you totally run out, that's still not amazing. He said, amazing is if you're running out of gas and the gas station comes to find you. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I love T.D. Jakes. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that before. You know? and, and then I realized that's the message that Jesus is saying. It's not that, you know, well, you'd better get seeking God if you're lost. It's saying, God is aggressively seeking us when we're lost. Whether we know we're lost or not, we might still be nibbling our way along. And he's pursuing us. I love that image. That's an amazing thing. And, and, and I need to know that God is pursuing me in all my uh, lost situations, you know. Sometimes... You know, it's something real tangible, and sometimes uh, we've gotten lost because of, you know, our pretending, pretending everything's okay, pretending everything's great, uh, pretending we're a certain way so people like us, you know, and it starts out with a little lie, and then it becomes more and more. Pretty soon, we, we lose sight of who we are. We don't even know who we are anymore, because we're living this image, or this, this pretense. The, I love Brendan Manning's writing. Uh, this is some um, ruthless trust. I've quoted from this before. Here's what he said. Honesty with others and with yourself is a precious commodity seldom found in either the world at large or the church. He gets that. He says, is there anyone I can level with? That's the question. Is there anyone I can level with? Anyone I dare tell that I am benevolent and malevolent? Chaste and randy, compassionate and vindictive, selfless and selfish. That beneath my brave words lives a frightened child. That I dabble in religion and pornography. That I've blackened a friend's character, betrayed a trust, violated a confidence. That I'm tolerant and thoughtful and a bigot and a blowhard. And I hate hard rock. Well, I don't know where that comes from. Like, I'm sure. Okay, there's a limit. <laughs> Sensing that if I bear my soul, I'll be abandoned by, by my friends and ridiculed by my enemies, I remain in hiding, borrowing from the cosmetic kit to put on my pretty face. I veil my unstated distrust behind a cheerful countenance, mask my fears behind sanguine pretense, and present a false self that is mostly admirable, mildly prepossessing, and superficially happy. Later, I hate myself for my flagrant dishonesty. What do we do? We're lost. We're lost. He goes on to point out that maybe the, the most uh, shocking statement in the whole Bible is Jesus saying, I call you friend. I call you friend even with all of that phoniness going on. I'll love you regardless. You don't have to be perfect for me. I'm going to love you all the way through. I'll love you if you're at the bottom of the heap. I'll love you if you're in hiding. I'll love you whatever. You don't have to climb the ladder for me to earn my love. I call you friend. That is so, so powerful.
You know, um, it was funny. I I usually pray for the lost. You know, that's what a pastor does. Some of you have crossed my prayers um, mm -hmm. and your issues and all those things. I want God to go and get you and you know, love you back home, celebrate over you. I mean, sincerely, I mean, that's what I do. So yesterday, I'm in this confluence of anger, frustration, and depression. I think it's trying to get away from me, you know, every minute. And, and it's just getting worse. Everything I touch gets more frustrating until finally I, was, um, I actually sent a poison Facebook post to a friend of mine who's a missionary in Africa. <laughs> and uh, and I, because of my riddle, and I have like two seconds before I press send, so I actually sat there for those two seconds and thought, you know, I don't have to send this. Yeah, I will. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, in the middle of the night, I'm awake, stewing about these things, and uh, trying to figure out how to fix at least one of them. You know, fix something so that I don't have to consider myself uh, lost. And it, and it hit me like anything. God saying, "John, when are you going to admit that you're lost?" You're lost in your anger. You're lost in your depression. You're lost in your frustration. You're lost in this whole thing. When are you going to admit that? And it was very strange. It was like I had to go, okay, Lord, I'm lost. I'm lost. The middle of the night, last night. Good thing we had that extra hour. I needed it. I'm lost in this. And I can't fix any of it. And then it was like the Lord said, okay, thank you. And I went to sleep. Now, still woke up this morning and it's me, okay? So, there, but I have to come to grips with the fact that as long as I deny my lostness and my need for the Lord to work in my life, I've blocked him. I've blocked him. Not that he doesn't love me, not that he doesn't pursue me, not that he doesn't want to take me back triumphantly and joyfully, right? Bring me home. But I've blocked it. Until I can say, all right, you're, you're right, I'm lost. Now what do we do? And he goes, thank you, I'll show you. Not tonight, but I'll show you, you know. Now, we've got to stop and turn around. Um, Jesus said in this passage, he calls his friends and neighbors together, says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep, and I tell them, in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous ones who don't need to repent. But we don't talk a lot about repentance here, right? We don't pound with it. But I think most of the time for me, instead of repenting and saying, okay, look, here's what it is. You're right, Lord, I'm wrong. Okay, I'm willing to change. I'll turn around and go your way. I go, don't need you yet, Lord. I've still got a handle on this. I can take care of this. I don't need you. You go work with those troubled people. You know, you know who they are. And uh, I'll be okay. I'll work it out. That's what I do. That's not repentance. There's no rejoicing over us standing there saying, I don't need you, Lord. There is no rejoicing in, at home and in, the, in heaven over our saying, Lord, go help somebody else. Right? The rejoicing is when we go, I agree with you. I agree with you. And then we come home. There's a... I wasn't going to refer to this passage, but it kept literally this morning on my desk, it kept flopping open. 
to Isaiah. It's, it's the weirdest thing. It kept popping open. I'm going, what's wrong? And then I went, why don't you read what it's open to? <laughs> Isaiah 53, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And then get this, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Westfall? Uh oh, is that there? We all have gone away. What does that mean? Each of us has turned to their own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not saying we're necessarily all that bad, you know. It just means we've gone our own way. We've got it figured out. We, we can handle it. We can do it. We don't need the Lord. And I think there's, there's only freedom when we discover and we admit, we repent that we need the Lord. That we're the lost ones. And then our prayer is, come find me. Come find me. And instead of a pathetic cry that's never going to be answered, it actually becomes a prayer that allows us to be carried home by the Lord.